My name is Abraham Polanski, a founder of the French Jewish Underground. Born in Russia, I moved to Toulouse, France, where I became an electrical engineer. But then came the Nazis, who invaded France in May 1940. By June, the French army surrendered to them. I responded to the dire situation by founding an underground military organization called La Main Forte, meaning, the strong hand. Our goal was to organize a worldwide fighting force that would conquer and take Palestine from the British. That, of course, would not happen overnight. In the meantime, the Nazi murderers came to France. The notorious SS general, Reinhard Heydrich, declared at the Wannsee conference that Europe would be combed of Jews, from west to east. But in fact it happened the other way around. From east to west, it started with the brutality of the Einsatzgruppen on the Russian front, but in time the rounding up and deportation of Jews to the camps became Nazi policy in Western Europe as well, even here in France. When it comes to France, we need to take a look back at the Third French Republic, spanning the period from 1875 to 1940. A watershed event took place in the middle of those years, the notorious Dreyfus Affair, culminating in 1905. The ultimate acquittal of a Jewish-French military officer, Captain Alfred Dreyfus, unjustly accused of treason, brought about a genuine separation of church and state as a new progressive attitude took hold in France. The society became truly open to minorities. Jews served freely and openly in the military, even as generals. Jewish judges, politicians, and legislators became a genuine part of French culture. France in the 1930s even saw its first Jewish prime minister, the left-leaning Léon Blum, but make no mistake, the dark background noise of anti-Semitism was still around. The anti-Semitic journalist, Edouard Drummond, declared that France had become Judaized and that Jews challenged the very nature of the French state. What is the exact meaning of the frenzied campaign organized by world Jewry to panic France, dishonor the French army, and in so doing, put it in no condition to play a role in Europe. This campaign simply means that the totality of interests of which Jewry is composed has taken a position against France and finds it advantageous that France ceased to be a great European power. Of course, there were still dreadful memories of trench warfare on French soil, and the notion of rebuilding the army was far removed from French priorities. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, the main idea was to avoid war. There must be no replay of World War I. The many cemeteries dotting the landscape reminded the French of the horrors that war can bring. Consequently, when the Nazi menace arose and the Second World War broke out, the attitude of the French was quite the opposite of England's defiance. Northern France was occupied in just a short period in 1940. The German Blitzkrieg was total shock, and the new reality of occupation left the French reminiscing about the pre-war past. While Germany directly occupied the north of France, a separate, German allied government was established in the town of Vichy and extending across the whole southern half of the country. For a good many French it was infinitely preferable to reside in Vichy France than under direct occupation. After all, the south of France, with its magnificent Riviera, had always been a place to vacation and convalesce. Consequently, a mass exodus to the south and sud, as up to 10 million of the country's 40 million people fled to Vichy. Historically, France was one country in Europe that had always been open to receiving refugees. And so they came. Over three million refugees, including Italians fleeing Mussolini, Spanish Republicans, and 200,000 Jews, mostly Eastern European, along with some from the Balkans. There were about 300,000 Jews already in France in 1933, but now that number ballooned. At the Vansi Conference, it was calculated that there were 
165,000 Jews in occupied France, and a staggering 700,000 in unoccupied territory, that is, Vichy France. The head of the new collaborationist government in Vichy was the aged Marshal Philippe Pétain, considered a hero of World War I. But now his role was to seek compromise with the Nazi administration. On June 17, 1940, Pétain addressed his people on the radio and temporarily, at least, assuaged their fears. Frenchmen, having been called upon by the President of the Republic, I today assumed the leadership of the government of France. I give to France the gift of my person in order to alleviate her suffering. In these painful hours, my thoughts go out to the unfortunate refugees who, in an extreme penury, are furrowing our roads. I express to them my compassion and my concern. It is with a heavy heart that I say to you today that the fighting must stop. I spoke last night with the enemy and asked him if he is ready to seek with us the means to put an end to the hostilities. May all Frenchmen rally to the government over which I preside during this difficult ordeal and calm their anxieties so that they can better listen only to the faith they have in the destiny of the fatherland. Understandably, there was great interest among the French in fleeing occupied France for the South. In short order, Pétain was given a new charge by his Nazi overlords. Deal with the exodus from north to south. So the old war hero called on his own people to return to direct German occupation in the north. Return to yourself, he declared. Immense tasks face France. One has only to stop and think of the refugees and the supply problem to estimate their gravity and scope. The nation's communications must be restored. Each man must be returned to his hearth and his job. In these dark days, after France has been forced to the ground militarily, new trials have been inflicted upon her. International capitalism and socialism exploited and degraded France. Both participated in preliminaries of the war. We must create a new order in which we no longer admit them. Your work will be defended. Your families will have the respect and protection of the nation. We must recreate lost confidence. The French family will remain the depository for France's long and honorable history. We know that youth must live and draw its strength from the open air which will prepare it for life's battles. We must see to that. Let us give ourselves to France. She always has led her people to greatness. It's been said that Pétain was basically in a dance with the old values of the French Revolution. Liberty, equality, fraternity. In Vichy, France, all would be redefined. There would be a new triad of values and a new official motto. Fatherland, family, and work. Keep the Nazis happy, and maybe they'll leave us alone. Nonetheless, for Hitler, France had always been a sword in the back, stemming from Germany's great humiliation at the Treaty of Versailles. He was reluctant to enter a full coalition with France. Instead, the French must simply accept the terms of the armistice, allowing Germany peace of mind. And speaking of work, French labor would be used. By the hundreds of thousands, the French would be conscripted to work for Germany. Still, among the French there was no real opposition to Pétain. The overall attitude was, wait and see what will happen next. There were of course other French leaders who stood defiantly against the Nazi occupation. Charles de Gaulle is a prime example, as he left France for Britain, joining forces with Churchill. But oddly, the French people did not rally to his side, seeing his actions as those of a maverick. The common sentiment was, ni Pétain, ni de Gaulle. Not Pétain, and not de Gaulle. It's important to point out that while the Vichy leadership was conservative, it wasn't fascist. Still, for Pétain and the Vichy leaders, it was easy to blame the war and all of France's troubles on the Third French Republic and on Léon Blum. And that certainly smacks of anti-Semitism. On October 3, 1940, 
Jews in France were now defined even more broadly than the criteria of the Nuremberg Laws, as people who had at least two, not three, Jewish grandparents. French Jews were incredulous. They saw themselves on an equal footing with the rest of the French population. They were leaders in French society. Many had even prevented Eastern European Jews from entering into the organizational structure of French Jewry. And that brings up a debatable issue. Recall that in Hungary, no outside pressure from the Nazis was required to bring about the issuance of anti-Semitic laws. It was all a Hungarian initiative. But in this case, we can say that no French government under Marshal Pétain would have passed such laws. This had to be German pressure. And things were about to get worse. On March 20th, 1941, the Commissariat for Jewish Questions was created to oversee the implementation of the new anti-Semitic policies. The question for us Jews was, when must we admit that the Third Republic is gone forever? It's time to disentangle the past from the present. Perhaps we can find common ground. After all, the values of Vichy, fatherland, family, and work are also Jewish values. So it was that the chief rabbi of France spoke openly of rapprochement with Vichy. The response of the Jews of France was the same as the response of the French in general. Wait and see. In time came the Aryanization of the French economy, which must be cleansed of Jewish economic power. Still, there were no ghettos in France. The Yellow Star did not have to be worn until June 1942. The first deportation of Jews from France began in March 1942. But almost all were Eastern European Jews. Native-born French Jews were not affected. But in July 1942 the Jews of Paris began to be rounded up for deportation. In August 1942 Vichy was targeted. The government of Vichy, always collaborating with Germany, allowed Jews to be assembled in camps in the south of France. The question was whether the French citizenry would assist in the roundups. For my part, in January 1942, I and labor movement Zionist activists helped establish an underground Jewish militia called the Armée Juive, or Jewish Army. Another underground activist named Lucien Lablin and I led the Jewish Army, which was a commando force composed of the best and most promising members of the Zionist youth movements. We all took an oath, placing our right hand on the blue and white flag, and saying, I swear fidelity to the Jewish Army and obedience to its leaders. May my people live again, may Eretz Israel be reborn. Liberty or death. During the winter of 1943 and 1944, our escape network helped some 300 of our members successfully flee to Spain and then to Palestine. Some Jews were in fact offered to the Germans by the French, but the number was still far below the 50,000 that the Nazis demanded. We can make a generalization here that through all the shifting values of those days, a new period of negotiation between church and state was opened up in France, one not seen since the Dreyfus Affair. Vichy's line was, we must collaborate with Germany in order to cleanse French society. But this did not go down well. Previously, there had been an equilibrium of sorts between state and society. But now, French clergy, largely silent, since the Dreyfus case when it came to politics, took the lead in opposition to the state. The admonition that went out was, don't grant Pétain any legitimacy in dealing with the Jewish question. There was no barrage of pastoral letters. There didn't need to be. There was instead a moral message communicated directly from pulpit to parishioners. What resulted was a trickle-down effect. The time of wait and see was over. There would be a firm break with Vichy. By the summer of 1942, the resistance to the government 
was legitimized. It had become a Christian duty. About 80,000 Jews were deported from France in the end. Nothing to brag about, but far fewer than the hundreds of thousands of Jews who lived there. The majority of French Jews found escape. In over 6,000 towns all across France, individual French gave significant aid and shelter to their Jewish neighbors. Organized Jewish groups also saved thousands of lives by falsifying documents. With the help of friends, institutions, and individuals, various Jewish groups were able to hide up to 7,000 children. Many French Catholic prelates and all Protestant pastors actively opposed the Vichy and uh, Nazi Jewish policies and hid Jews or supported rescue actions along with a large and growing part of the French population. As a result, about two-thirds of French Jewry was saved. Apart from organized Jewish groups, many individual Jews participated in general French resistance groups. In the final analysis, it was all about making a statement on a personal level. And that made all the difference. Mm -hmm.